gracious Heavenly Father, I just give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor for all that you are, who you are, and all that you've done in our life. I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to continue on with our studies here in John as we feast upon your word in these final hours before you return. I just ask your blessing upon all that is said. I ask that you would filter out the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which, tr which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Gospel of John, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 1, the area of verses 20 through 25, the account of uh, those that were sent from the Sanhedrin to interrogate John the Baptist in his ministry announcing the coming of the Messiah. When they came to him, they asked him if he were the promised Messiah, and he clearly stated that he was not. And then they asked him a couple of other questions. Was he Elijah or was he that prophet? In both cases, he answered no. And when they asked him who he was, he didn't answer who he was. He answered that he was a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He could have said a lot of things, but he didn't focus on himself. And I believe that that is important to take note of in the text. It's a fact that many Christians, when they study through this, they, they tend to overlook that, or they tend to ignore that, or they, they tend to, to, to simply not stop and meditate on the significance of that. Now, he replied with a verse of Scripture. They should have known that verse of Scripture. They were the experts in the Old Testament. They had uh, many times, uh, I'm sure, they had read Isaiah chapter 40 and they were, they were looking for a reigning king but not a suffering savior. And John's answer was an answer of scripture. This is so much like what I see in Christianity today, folks. They were, they were concerned about who he was. If you get an invitation to speak at at some Christian assembly, you know, it, it's got to be somebody impressive. Man, we got to go hear that guy. He's, he's got, you know, 14 PhDs or who knows what. We have to make sure that you'd be interested in hearing this person speak before we invite him to speak. Because he's an expert in these fields. That's very characteristic of the attitude of the flesh. It's very characteristic of the attitude of the world. And that's, that mentality has been carried over into Christianity, into a place in which it doesn't belong, exalting the individual. Who are you? I'm a voice crying in the, in the wilderness. And, and what I say is make straight the way of the Lord as said the prophet Isaiah. So he told them not about his person, but about his message. It's also significant to take note of. Who are you? And his answer is, this is my message. And it's the message that they, that they needed. And it's the message that they should have understood. Verse 25, they should have immediately recognized the passage of Scripture and the import uh, of that passage of Scripture contained everything that they needed to know for that particular moment in time. Of course, John the Baptist could have came and said a lot of things. He could have, he, he could have, he, I mean, Stop and think. He could have talked about a lot of things. So the, 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 the fact that the message was relevant is also 
for the, for the moment is also something to stop and think about, to meditate on, to ponder on. Folks, we don't want to brush through these passages without really thinking and meditating and pondering upon the significance of every word that the Holy Spirit has said. Now, I'm first to agree that Isaiah chapter 40 begins a division in the book of Isaiah that speaks of the glory of the nation Israel. But it also infers in chapter 53 that in order for that glory to be established, there must be one who was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, the one whose, whose visage was so marred more than any man, the one upon whom our transgressions were laid. And that's the biblical truth that they were unwilling to accept. And so they say in verse 25, you don't have the credentials. You know, who are you? You don't have the credentials. Why then do you baptize if you're not Christ, nor Elijah, nor the promised prophet in Deuteronomy 18? And I pointed out in my last video, they clearly didn't understand that when Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like unto him, it would be Christ. But the Jews had decided that passage meant that there would be another human like Moses who would be raised up, and that's who they're referring to in their comments here. They hadn't seen that the promised prophet like Moses was in fact the Messiah, and so they have three possibilities. Are you, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Or are you the promised prophet of Deuteronomy 18? And since he denied being any of those, he therefore, in their minds, he doesn't have any right to, to baptize. It's clear that under the law, there was a purpose for what John was doing and there was a prerequisite for what he was doing. That's the thing that we need to understand because in the very context of our present study, we have reference made to the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to realize that the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ was His being ordained into the priesthood. There was, there was the promised priests, and it's and it's it's really quite interesting. No, nobody can be absolutely certain, but the the bulk of evidence points to the fact that Jesus Christ was baptized where Israel crossed the Jordan to come into the promised land, where Joshua led them to that to that place. They camped there for three days, crossed with the Ark of the Covenant. The priests, when their, feet, when their feet touched the waters, God commanded them to, many of you are familiar with the account, He commanded them to stand still, and God allowed them to pass over because He had backed up the waters. Sort of reminiscent to, to Moses parting the Red Sea. Now, historically, geographically, I've, I've, I've always found that interesting. In fact, there's, there's more that took place in that vicinity or, or in that spot than, than just uh, Joshua crossing over with the Israelites into the promised land of, of rest. And the fact that this is where our Lord was baptized, that's interesting enough. I believe Elijah was, if not at that spot, or but near that spot, was also taken up in a chariot of fire. But this is uh, this video. I mean, I, I, this is not really about. Uh, I, I don't want to really. I don't have time to get into the historical aspects, you know, of where you know Adam was, you know, the town in, in which the uh, the waters were of the River Jordan were backed up as far as the city of Adam, and the uh, possible. And I say possible. Please, please note. I'm saying possible significance of the name of that city being Adam and God's intention of pointing out that, that the name of that city being Adam and the spiritual, metaphysical, uh, if you want to put it that way, the significance of that. That the Messiah is entering where Israel entered the promised land. 
he's preparing the way, and there was some delay, of course, before Joshua and the Israelites, they totally possessed the land. And there, there would be some delay from the time the Messiah came in until Israel is restored to their glory, promised in prophetic scripture. Now, and that, that delay is what many of the commentators have called the church age. It's this period between Christ, the suffering Savior, and the return of Him reigning as King. So I find it of interest that His ordin ordination to the priesthood took place approximately, if not exactly, where Israel crossed the Jordan as they started their campaign against the city of Jericho. The Lord Jesus Christ came to John. John was astounded. There's no way I can do this. He's the one announcing the Messiah, the forerunner of the... Uh, uh, he's the forerunner of the Messiah. I'm in no way qualified to baptize you. That, that's true. It was not the qualification of the priest that required the ordination under the law. It isn't the requirement of the sinner. It's a requirement of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that Christ came to John and said, Suffer it to be so for now, for it behooves us, we are under obligation, to fulfill all righteousness to meet the demands of the law. If Christ is going to be uh, prophet, priest, and king from the human standpoint, as He came to Israel as their promised Messiah, as the Son of God incarnate in human flesh, it was necessary that He be ordained a priest, and that's what happened at His baptism. It was not a baptism for remission of sin, because He had none. It was, it was not a baptism for repentance. He didn't need a change of mind. It was the baptism of ordination. John is coming as one who is qualified to baptize, not only for ordaining one to the priesthood, but also qualified to talk to the people and identify them with a change of mind concerning that their Messiah who came. Concerning the things of God, which we call a baptism unto repentance. And His ministry was peculiarly, particularly at this time, to Israel. Baptism in the epistles, folks, go past Calvary, past the cross, past Pentecost, and now, after Israel being set aside, the church age coming in, we see baptism in the epistles as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've gotten in trouble saying that, but I believe that John declares very clearly here in the, the 31st verse that the reason that he baptized with water, not the Holy Spirit, but with water was to manifest Christ to Israel. And if you want to be baptized, okay, in the Mississippi River or in a cow pond, if, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. That's fine. But that's why John came baptizing with water. Their argument in the 25th verse is, he's not qualified to do this. Not qualified. He's, he's not a member of their ranks. He's not a member of the priesthood. And he's not qualified to baptize. None of them would have ordained Jesus Christ to the priesthood because he wasn't a descendant of Aaron or Levi. And if you look at Hebrews, you'll see that our Lord sprang from Judah and that he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so God ordained him as a priest. And he did it through John the Baptist. But these Sadducees and in, in Sanhedrin and Pharisees, they wouldn't have done that. They would not have done that. In fact, we're told in verse 24 that we're looking at primarily the question 
the questions of the Pharisees, the Sadducees were, were, were what I'd call liberal uh, theologians. They didn't believe in any resurrection of the dead. And, and they were really quite lax, you know, when it came to, in, in how they interpreted the law. It was the Pharisee who said, you know, if you spit on the Sabbath day, you know, and your spit, you know, plows a furrow, well, then it's working, that it's working. Therefore, you're breaking the law. So, you know, they're what you'd call the nitpickers, you know, regarding the law. I've mentioned in a past video how they'd set up fence laws, which God never gave to, to you know, as somewhat of a barrier to prevent you from even getting near anywhere, anywhere near breaking God's law. That's how nitpicking they were. John had no right to baptize. He wasn't ordained a priest. He wouldn't declare who he was or what his credentials w was. You know, when he was asked, all he said was, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Those are not good credentials. Not good credentials. You know, what right do you got to baptize? That's the way you ought to read it. Verse 25, what right do you have to baptize? You're, you're not the Messiah or uh, you're not Elijah. You're not even the promised prophet. What right do you have to do this? And John answered, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. You don't know him. The word is oida in the Greek. It's different from gnosko, which is an experiential knowledge. They didn't even have a perfect knowledge of him. Now, we an intellectual knowledge. Uh, the word oida has been compared to. Well, I see what you're saying, or I I know what you're trying to say. It's kind of a. It's not gnosko. It's not experiential knowledge. Now, we know that he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, but what John is saying here is that I am performing exactly what you Pharisees say is required under the law. I ordained the Messiah with water. I ordained him to the priesthood. He's the promised Messiah. You ought to recognize that. You got the scriptures. You, you, you knew he was going to be born. You know, you could have worked out even the times of that from Daniel chapter 9 and you know exactly or or very closely you know of where he was born you know he's going to be despised and rejected in fact you know you know an awful lot about him but here he is he's right here in your midst you don't know him I, I'm just you know he came unto his own and his own received him not you know, John could have said, you know, you look, you got some 300 some odd prophecies or more concerning the first advent of the Messiah, and I've ordained him with water, and there's a whole lot of people here, a whole lot of people here, you ought to know these things, he's here among you, and you don't know it. Think of the import of those words. The Almighty, eternal God, Creator of heaven and earth is in the midst of these people and they don't know it. They don't know it. The word in the text is whom. It's really improper to say that they didn't know it. The word's not it. The word is whom. They did not, whom they, didn't, they did not know. The word in the text is whom. Whom you do not know. What a statement to have to make to the leaders of the Jewish people. You know, the theological experts, those skilled in the Scriptures who were, who were putting burdens upon the backs of these people in the name of Jehovah or, or Yahweh, they didn't know Him. There's a lot could, I could spend a whole... I could, I could preach on that, folks, for a month. And I think many of you know, what, know why. It's an interesting study to go through the four Gospels and suddenly come to the amazing realization that in the three to four years of the earthly ministry of our Lord, He spent very, very little time in Jerusalem. Very little time. Which was the seat of the theological world of Judaism. 
the theological center of the people whom he came to redeem. He spent very little time there. Verse 27, He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. Not even unworthy to untie his shoestrings. I'm not even worthy to be a slave. And folks, that is total depravity. You know, there's always that insidious undercurrent in Christian circles that somehow we were just a little bit better than, than the other guy, that, that, than those other people. You know, and because of that, God, you know, has redeemed us because we did something that others didn't do, and we make redemption the result of human effort, which is not true. I'm not even worthy to be his slave, let alone a brother in Christ. These things, it says, were done in Beth Bethabara, and many believe this is where Israel crossed the Jordan. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's absolutely true, but there's enough, there's enough uh, uh, hint of that that it's interesting. I find it extremely interesting, quite intriguing, in fact, as we, as we look at the first coming of Christ, that he was ordained to the priesthood, entering into his earthly ministry as our priest, prophet, and king, and at the crossing of the River Jordan where Israel entered the land. In verse 29, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And I've spent some time in past videos talking about how I believe that the atonement, when Jesus died on the cross, He removed all of Adam's transgression. All. It's, it's different to talk about Him dying in our place, His, our kinsman, redeemer, substitutionary death in the place of God's elect. That's, that's, that's a whole other subject. If you want to uh, refer you, I have to, I have got to refer you back to past videos here in John uh, where I discuss that. John says, Behold the Lamb of God. It has the genitive here. We've talked about the genitive quite a bit. In fact, all through Colossians, Romans, Ephesians, I've talked about the genitive quite a lot. Possessive genitive. Behold the Lamb of God. In the English, we read it, Behold God's Lamb. Revelation chapter 5, John wept that no one was able to open the book with the seven seals. He, he was weeping greatly that no man was able to do it. No man was able to open the book. And one of the elders said, Don't cry, don't, don't weep. Behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's why Jesus Christ was baptized of John the Baptist. He wasn't of the priestly line. He was the, li he was the lion of the tribe of Judah. But we are told that he forms a priesthood like the priesthood of Melchizedek. Well, because Melchizedek was not of the line of Levi either. And that Christ was ordained a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that ordination was typified by John baptizing our Lord. Now, I mean, uh, look, if you could picture yourself, John, you know, standing there, seeing this scroll with seven seals, and all of a sudden he's told Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, what would you do? He says, I looked, and what did I see? A lamb. I expected to see a lion, but I saw a lamb. Because the lion and the lamb are both types of Christ. They are inseparable. They're one and the same. He's the lamb before he's the lion. He's the suffering savior before he's the reigning monarch. But think what these words must have meant to these Pharisees. 
you got to realize that the Pharisees, folks, were the experts in the law. In order to even be a Pharisee, you had to be able to, to repeat verbatim the first five books of the Bible. In fact, one of the one of the, the tests that some of the older Pharisees, they loved to do, was roll up the scroll, which was those five books, drive a nail through it, and say, now, it went through this word on the first layer. You know, where, where do you think it went through on the second layer, and the, and the third layer, and the fourth layer? You know, and you were supposed to know. The rabbis, the Pharisees, were absolutely sold on the design of the Old Testament scriptures in the Hebrew. And since every letter is also a number, they'd add up the total of the page and they'd, they'd love to go through the book and look at every second letter, every third letter, every seventh letter, every, you know, 49th letter, letter every 50th letter. And, and, you know, and they came up with all kinds of reasons to believe that there was a divine design in the text. And I'm not an expert in numerology. I know they actually give that as a Bible course in, uh, a course in Bible college. There's a difference between uh, horoscope type stuff, you know, astrology, you know, and biblical numerology. Huge difference. You know, I've got a lot of books on numerology, and I know people get wrapped up in it until that's all that they think about. They don't think about anything else. Uh, I'm persuaded uh, that there's a design, that God is a designer. But I believe the book is there to reveal the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I don't care if, he, if God does that with letters or numbers. I believe He does with both. Does that with both. And I don't want to get sidetracked on something that would take my mind off of the fact that I'm looking at the revelation of God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, who became my Redeemer. These experts who knew it all by heart must have known that Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac. You know, what kind of God is it who would ask a man to sacrifice his only son? Well, it's the kind of God who would sacrifice his son so that we might have life. But being a God of grace, he stayed Abraham's hand. Abraham was so dedicated to God that he was willing to give his own son and God ordained, ordained him to be true to the type that God our Father loves us so much he was willing to sacrifice his own son. Now, you know, if you remember the account, they journeyed for a ways. Abraham offered Isaac where many say where Jesus Christ died years after Abraham and Isaac were gone. God Almighty placed His Son at the same area, crucified His, His Son, and did not withdraw His hand. And yes, I did say he, the Father crucified Him. There's enough evidence to point to the fact that it was absolutely the Father who gave His Son to die. Of course, when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, it wasn't until, well, he, he came to do what the Father sent him to do. And he said it was finished. Take note of the fact that he said it's, it, it, it is finished before he expired. Why, why did he say it is finished before he died? When his, the very, his very death was so important. Have you ever thought about that? It's because it's the one thing that he had to do alone. Anyhow, I've if if I've looked into that location, it's 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 about you could walk it in three and a half minutes if you can picture three hundred meters, which is it's uh, about I, I suppose it's about three three to three to four football fields. You could walk it in three and a half minutes. That's how. 
that's how close at least if if it wasn't exact it was at least within that 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 proximity of where Abraham offered his son Isaac and Jesus Christ died in your place so they journeyed for a while when they got close Abraham told his servants to wait and that he and the boy the lad would go on alone alone folks don't let that escape your attention. You need to look at the, the type. Nobody went with him. You have no part in your redemption. Folks, no synergism. When Jesus Christ died, you didn't do anything for the removal of your sin. Modern Christianity has so departed from what God has taught in His Word that you've got to start it and you've got to make sure it's complete. It's finished. When the Scriptures clearly, clearly point out that God did it all. The lad and I are going it alone. The thrilling thing is, as we look at the account, Isaac had to be, he had to be about 30 years old. I know it's his boy. He wasn't a toddler, as many think. I don't even, I don't even believe he was a teenager. I believe he was about 30. And there was no resistance. Like, you know, you know, hey, my dad's lost it. You know, the guy's cracking up. Uh, I, uh, I'm persuaded at his age, Isaac could have overtaken his father, but he didn't. Isaac didn't resist. He didn't question him. He was a willing sacrifice. He was a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Abraham's answer to Isaac is what the Holy Spirit is pointing out in the words of John the Baptist. Behold God's Lamb. The one promised to Abraham, the one that Abraham revealed to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. John says to these experts who knew that story better than you do, who knew every word, every jot, every tittle, knew it by heart, and all of a sudden, this nobody who won't even tell them anything about his background, his education, his experience, only that he's a voice crying in the wilderness, answers them with Scripture. They don't want Scripture. They want credentials. John says, Behold God's Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And the word there, the, sin, the word sin, is singular. Not sins. Sin, singular. It's kind of it's always been astounding to me as as I hear Christians quote this. They always put the S on the end of it. Folks, it's singular in the English. It's singular in the Greek. People take words in the Bible that they wouldn't take otherwise. Christians do that all the time. Sin singular almost always refers to the sin nature. Romans 6.11, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sins, no, unto sin, the sin nature. And world, is that everybody that's ever lived? Or is that only God's elect? Or is that only Israel? And folks, you've got to, you've got to make up your own mind on this. I've told you what I believe. The word world is a, is a word of design, of order. Okay, of like the world religious system. I heard some guy on TV say he was going to talk about the world of entertainment. Well, I, I don't think he meant everybody that's ever lived. He was talking about the designed arrangement of entertainment. You know, all that trash, all that garbage. That's what the Word is. So I don't believe that you can look at this and say that He took away everybody's sins in the sense of a substitutionary death. He did remove Adam's transgression. I think you have to ask, what system is He talking about? What people did He come for? He either means Israel or He means His people. The designed system of His own people. And you could, I you know, suppose in this context, limit that to Israel. I don't. I think it's the, the designed, organized system, the world religious system 
not only Israel, but all who are His own, including those who were not, were that their Adam's transgression was removed. Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. But then there comes a time where we die in our own sins. The law come in when Paul said, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. I died. We can't blame Adam for God putting us in hell. No man's going to stand before God and say, why, are, why am I going to hell for something Adam did? I've covered this in past videos. I won't go through all that again. But what people did he come for? I'll just you have you have to make up your mind on that. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold or this flock, them also I must bring, that there might be one flock. And uh, so without getting into a whole another different subject, I just want to end on this note. And it has to do with our being God's children, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. We, we share with others that we are God's people, that He chose us. We didn't choose Him. That we're born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And, and that we can't be saved without God's help. And that mildly offends folks. But what offends so powerfully is the discovery that such freedom of cooperation simply doesn't exist. That man is truly in spiritual bondage in this matter and he has no power to assist in the process of his own salvation. And it's this that causes offense. You point out to people that we are not born again to become the children of God by the will of man that it, it's of God's own will and not ours that we are so reborn that it is not of Him who wills nor of Him who runs, but of God who shows mercy that repentance is granted to us and it's not a contribution that we make of ourselves, that the exercise of saving faith is a gift of God. Point all this out and suddenly we meet with strong reaction even among those who are God's children. A great number, a great number of believers who are otherwise well acquainted with their Bibles are strangely unaware of the fact that election is maintained throughout the Old and the New Testaments and nowhere more clearly so than, guess where? Right here in John. Just within the very first 14 verses of John, we find the fact of divine election and human inability set forth clearly when we're told that the power to become a child of God is not based on the will of man or the will of the flesh, but solely upon the will of God. And this grace and truth that came through Christ is only reinforced when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the scene of John the Baptist, one who is himself a man chosen and set apart by God to not exalt himself, but announce the presence of Israel's Messiah to those whom God had also elected to hear this message of grace and truth because they were his people. A message of grace and truth that the religious leaders of that day should have understood because they had God's word. A message of grace and truth that they instead found offensive because it offended their sense of pride and self-worth. A message of grace and truth that was proclaimed outside the ranks in the circle of the ecclesiastical system, a system that we are, uh, are not of. A message of grace and truth that they could offer no theological, no valid argument against. No defense against it. A message of grace and truth that was more than just a message, but was presented in the person of Christ Himself. The very embodiment, the very fulfillment of the law that the Pharisees could not keep, that could make no man righteous. 
religious leaders who were the most devoted individuals to the law who ever lived, who could quote the first five books of your Bible from memory. Can you do that? Can you do that? I can't do that. Can you do that? And here we are today, surrounded by a religious system that would have us believe that somehow we have the ability to do and should do what the religious leaders of Israel could not themselves do, gain merit and favor and standing with God by what we do and that through human merit. And I'm done. I, uh, I really should stick with just teaching and not preaching, but it's hard sometimes because I just get a little revved up when I get to talking about the difference between law and grace and especially when I get to talking about the world religious system as opposed to authentic Christianity of which we are a part. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.